right on that, the, the last day of the conference, you can change it now, the paper, again, the general summary. You will talk about the generalized stats and the theme for that. Uh, thank you. So, um... We need a couple of concepts. Uh, what I described last time, if you have a subset of Euclidean space, a bounded set, compact set with non-empty interior, um, then it's got a centroid. That's the average position of points in the set. And the centroid's an affine invariant. If you move the set by an affine map, the centroid, the image of the centroid is the centroid of the image. And if you have a convex set, then the centroid, the average position of points is in the set. Another concept we need is the inertia tensor. So if you have a, you have such a banded set with non-empty interior in Euclidean space, if the centroid is at the origin, then um, the inertia tensor is a quadratic. Um, and the definition is given a vector y, you form this integral over the compact set. And so um, you know, in, in physics, this is a moment of inertia tensor describes spinning objects. What this integral is doing is, given a vector y, you take the one dimensional, the line, spanned by this vector y, and given a point x, the, you take the distance, the distance d of x from that line, well, it's some distance, it varies with x, and this integral is um, the integral of the square of that distance times the square of the length of y. So the quadratic, this tensor, this, this polynomial, depends on a choice of inner product. It's an old theorem of Fritz John from, I don't know, 1940 or something, that if you have an object whose inertia tensor is given by the identity matrix, in other words, um, the inertia tensor is the normal y squared, um, then there's a constant with the property that your set is contained in k times the unit box. So I'm going to refer to this as the unit box. So the inertia tensor is given by the identity matrix, and the set is contained in some large box, and it contains a small box, and this constant only depends on dimension. Uh, Shantak, do you have a question? <laughs> so, um, the theorem of Wimberg, um So, you, I talked to, uh, about the hyperboloid model of hyperbolic space. If you have the unit disk in projective space, corresponding to the unit disk in projective space, there's a cone in affine space, a one dimension higher. And inside of that cone is a hyperboloid. Well, there's a similar hypersurface for any properly convex set. So if you have a properly convex set, you get this cone in affine space of one dimension bigger. And then the set curly D is defined as follows. You take all half spaces in this affine space with the property that the volume of the part of the cone that isn't in that half space, that has volume one. And you intersect all those half spaces. And the intersection is this convex set curly D. And um, the boundary of that convex set is this a smooth, strictly convex hypersurface. It meets every ray coming out of the origin inside the cone once. Um, if you take a volume preserving automorphism of the cone, then it sends this set to itself. So the, the set is preserved by the any automorphisms, any projective transformations that preserve the domain. And it has the following nice property that if you take the tangent plane to some point on the set, so you take some point x on the boundary of D, there's some tangent plane there. So that's, um, that's the pre-image of one under some affine map to the real line. And then the point is that the part of this hyperplane inside the cone, its centroid is this point X. Um, 
So it follows that it follows that you get a homeomorphism from the dual of the cone to the cone. The point is a point in a dual cone, the point in the dual cone is a dual vector that evaluates positive on the cone. And so um, if you take the centroid of the, the hyperplane, uh, sorry, the half space, um, if you take the centroid of this region um, and you find that to be the uh, image of this dual vector, that's the point in the cone. So that's a map from the dual cone to the cone. And it sends rays in the dual cone to rays in the cone. So it induces a map. It covers a map from the dual of the properly convex. So if, uh, you take the, it induces a map from the dual domain to the domain. And it's equivariant. If you take or an automorphism of the cone, if you take something that preserves this domain, the dual group preserves the dual domain, this dual action, and this map is equivariant. We're using the actions of gamma and the dual group. So now if you quotient out, if you have a properly convex domain, that's a quotient, if you have a properly convex manifold, that's a quotient of this domain by some discrete group of projective transformations preserving it, then this map covers a map from the dual manifold to the manifold. And so uh, this tells you that the dual of a properly convex manifold is homeomorphic to the original manifold. Uh, but this homeomorphism isn't a projective transformation. And this is our theorem of Vinberg. So, um, so there's an analog of the notion of centroid. So centroid, if you've got a banded convex set in Euclidean space, it's got a centroid. And there's an analog of centroid for subsets of a sphere. So imagine you've got a globe, a transparent globe. And then on the globe, you've got, you've got a subset. I'm calling the subset Belgium. And so Belgium has got a spherical center. And how do you find the spherical center of Belgium? Well, imagine... The globe is transparent, and you've got a light source at the center. And you've got a wall, and you rotate the globe, and you've got the shadow of Belgium on the wall. And, well, when you look at the shadow of Belgium on the wall, and the wall's an affine space, it's got a centroid. And so you need to rotate the globe until the centroid of the shadow it's the closest point to the center of the globe. And when you've done that, the point on the sphere that projects to the centroid, that's the spherical center of Belgium. In other words, um, if you choose an inner product, then um, given a vector, a unit vector y, um, if, you, if you choose an inner product, uh, given a vector y on the sphere, you get a half you get a hemisphere, the points on the sphere within distance pi over two of the given point, this open hemisphere. And then uh, you've got radial projection from the, um, this hemisphere onto the tangent plane. So I'm picturing the tangent plane to the sphere at a point Y, not as a vector space, but as this kind of hyperplane in um, this Euclidean space. So radial projection sends this hemisphere onto the tangent plane. So the point X goes, its image under radial projection is this point pi y of X, and, and that's a formula. And so the definition is if you have a properly convex set in omega in the sphere, then y is, a sphe is a, the spherical center of omega if the centroid of the radial projection of omega into the tangent plane is in fact the projection of y. So that's, that's what I was describing earlier. So that's the notion of spherical center. And then the observation is that a properly convex set um, has a unique spherical center. And what is that spherical center? So if you have this properly convex set, 
Um, and we've got an inner product. I mean, this whole discussion involves an inner product. <clears throat> so you have a property convex set in the sphere. There's this um, this um, domain, and that should say the boundary of a curly D. There's a lowest point on this uh, domain. It's the point on the boundary that minimizes the, um, the Euclidean norm. And the point is that that is the spherical center. And that just follows from the Wimberg's theorem that, I mean, um, if the, here the horizontal hyperplane is the tangent plane to this domain, it's also the tangent plane to this sphere. And the fact that the center, so the shadow of um, this uh, domain is uh, the part of this hyperplane inside the cone, and the centroid of this hyperplane by Vinberg's theorem is this point Y. So, um, so properly convex sets have a spherical center. Uh, and this whole discussion depends, though, on a choice of um, in a product. Shanta, do you have a question? So I'm going to use this to prove. So, so the one of the basic questions is: if you have a you have a sequence of properly convex projective structures on a manifold, and then they've got a holonomy, and so we've got this sequence of projective structures with holonomies, and suppose these are homomorphisms of the fundamental group of the manifold into well, we can say the special linear group, and suppose that those homomorphisms converge. Question, do the projective structures converge? Is there some limiting projective structure with that homomorphism? And the answer is no, not always. I mean, we can take um, properly convex structures on a torus uh, where the limiting holonomy, the, tor the torus is shrinking down to a point and the limiting holonomy is trivial. And uh, there isn't a properly convex structure on the torus with trivial holonomy. So in general, it's not true. But um, there's a, an old theorem, Chukro's theorem. So, so what's happened here is that, the, I mean, the limit of the holonym is trivial. And uh, if this theorem is going to be true, the limiting holonym should be a discrete, faithful representation of the fundamental group. So Chukro's theorem, if you have a finitely generated group G, and you need an algebraic hypothesis that it does not contain a normal, infinite, nilpotent subgroup, so if you've got a group, a finitely generated group with this algebraic property, well, you can look at all the discrete faithful representations of that group into GLNR. Um, and um, that should probably be SLNR, actually. <laughs> oh, can't write on there, can I? Um, let's try writing on here. Uh, then um, that's closed in the Euclidean topology. So... Um, so if you have a strictly convex um, projective manifold, then in fact, um, its fundamental group has this um, algebraic property. So we actually have strictly convex manifolds. Uh, the limiting homomorphism will be discrete faithful. So that's looking good. So we're going to think about limits of strictly convex projective structures on a manifold. And um, <clears throat> OK, so we've got a limiting um, representation, discrete and faithful. Now, Benzikri theorem, each one of these domains is so that we can assume is some Benzikri domain. And what we'd like to know is that the domains converge to a properly convex domain, or actually a strictly convex domain. But they need not. I mean, we've got a sequence of representations where the holonomies converge. The problem is that these domains might not converge. Well, Benzikri says actually you can solve that problem. You can there's a you can you can map these domains, put them in Benzikri position, and then they will converge to some properly convex domain. So you can, you can move these domains by some projective transformation so they converge. 
But then you're conjugating the original representations. And when you conjugate the representations, the conjugated representations might not converge. So you can either have the representations converging or you can have the domains converging, but maybe not both. And uh, there's a solution to this problem. Um, so Benzacree says you can apply some projective transformation to put the domain in a nice position. The solution to the problem is to use a, a refined version of the Benzacree theorem. So you can put the domain into a nice position, not using an arbitrary projective transformation, but by using one which is a composition of an orthogonal map and a diagonal map. And, um, and then, and then you use a bit of magic called the box estimate. So the fact you, uh, once you know you can do this, and this follows from the existence of um, spherical centers, once you know you can do that, um, this um, box estimate gives the answer. So this is something I don't understand, but it's true. So, um, so okay, so, Suppose we have, you know, well, I've got the, the unit box in Euclidean space, and I'm thinking of Euclidean space instead as an affine patch in projective space. So suppose I have some, some projective transformation given by an n plus one by n plus one matrix A. And suppose that this matrix sends a unit box, the image of the unit box is contained in some multiple of the unit box. So I'm thinking of k bigger than 1, probably. In that case, the entries in the matrix are bounded by this multiple of the entry in the bottom right corner. I don't know why, but I'll prove it. Um, and why are we interested in that? Well, if I've got a domain, omega, that it contains the box B and is contained inside the big box, any projective automorphism of omega sends omega to itself, so it sends the box B inside of this box. Conclusion, every projective transformation of omega satisfies that equation. I don't know why it's true, but I'll prove it. Um, oops. Shout out if you have a question. So the proof is <laughs> completely elementary. So, so we've got this matrix, and we need to prove something about it. So here's the matrix. And um, one thing to notice, by the way, is um, if, if I scale this if I scale this matrix, I mean both sides scale the same way. So um, okay, so here's this matrix, and I'm calling the entry in the bottom corner alpha. And by multiplying the matrix by minus one, I can assume alpha is positive. And so what I've got to do is show that every entry in this matrix is at most two k times that entry. That's what I've got to prove. And so we've got the hypothesis. We're thinking about points in the unit box. So here, so this point with last coordinate one is in the unit box, if and only if the other coordinates in absolute value are at most one. So that's the condition we have. That we take a point satisfying this property, a vector, we multiply it by this matrix, and what we end up with is a point that's in k times the box which means that the coordinates, these coordinates, the first n coordinates divided by the last coordinate in absolute value are less than or equal to k. So we're going to use that to prove um, the box estimate. And so the first thing is we're going to prove that uh, the box estimate works in the last column for the blue entries. So what is the last column? Well, the last column is the image under the matrix A of the last basis vector. And so the last column must be in k times the box. So what is the last column? Well, these are the entries in the last column. And so if I divide the last column by alpha, then I'll have these entries divided by alpha and a 1 is in k times the box. So this, these numbers divided by alpha in absolute value are less than k. So these numbers in absolute value are less than k times alpha. So it's true for the last column. Okay, next I'm going to prove it for the last row. So think about the point, um, think about 
um, the point T times EJ plus EN plus 1. That point is in the unit box if and only if the absolute value of T is at most 1. So let's call that point P. If I take the image of P under the matrix, I get some other point Q that's got to be in K times the box. So let's think about multiplying the matrix A by this vector. And what are we going to get? Well, we're going to get the last column plus T times the Jth column. So, um, so uh, if we think about the entry in the last column in the bottom row, we discover that T times the entry in the Jth column plus alpha can't be zero because if the last coordinate, if this is zero, it's certainly not in the box. So this can't be zero no matter what T is. So because this can't be zero no matter what T is, the absolute value of this number cannot be as big as alpha. Otherwise, I could find a number T between minus one and plus one to make this zero. So um, uh, that um, gives the uh, answer for the bottom row. The, um, uh, here, by the way, I'm assuming K is bigger than one here. So here we prove that the, the entries along the bottom row are at most alpha, and assuming K is bigger than one, that's less than K alpha. So the result is proved along the bottom row. So that just leaves the rest of the matrix. So it's the same strategy. Again, we're looking at um, this point Q, and it's got to be in K times box. So the last column plus T times column J has got to be a point in K times the box. So if we look at the ith coordinate of the answer divided by the last coordinate, the absolute value of that's got to be less than k for this thing to be in k times the box. So what is the ith coordinate divided by the nth plus one coordinate? Well, it's um, the uh, i n plus one entry along here plus t times the i a the i j entry divided by what we just discovered was the last coordinate. Um, so you get that this quantity has got to be at most k. And that's got to be true whenever the absolute value of t is less than 1. So in particular, this number can't be 0. So that means that this number can't be as big as alpha. Otherwise, we could choose this thing to be 0. So um, this in absolute value is less than alpha. So that means no matter what t is, the thing on the bottom is at most um, two times alpha. So the thing on the bottom is at most two times alpha. So that means the thing on the top is at most k times two alpha. And you're done. About the hundredth time I've been through this, it worked. <laughs> so, OK, so you have the box estimate. OK, so once you've got that, we can prove limits exist. So. Are there any questions before I go on? OK, so we've got a closed manifold, dimension at least two. And we've got a sequence of uh, strictly convex uh, projective structures on it. And these have got holonomies. And we're going to assume the holonomies converge. So I'm going to fix some affine patch in Euclidean space. And now I want to move all of these domains by an orthogonal map so that they all have the same center, maybe the origin in Euclidean space. Um, so I can certainly do that, but I've got some fixed inner product. So these have all got spherical centers, and I can just use an orthogonal transformation. Orthogonal transformation sends spherical centers to spherical centers. So I can get all the spherical centers um, to be the origin, all the centroids to be um, at the origin. Now, once uh, um, the um, centroid is at the origin, I've got some quadratic form. I've got the inertia tensor, a symmetric uh, it's a quadratic form. So I can do a rotation around the origin to get the inertia tensor to be a diagonal matrix. Okay, so I can choose 
orthogonal transformations, I can move the domain so the spherical centers are at the origin in this affine patch and the inertia tensors are diagonal. And I'm going to, and so the point is, I've done a conjugacy by an orthogonal transformation. An orthogonal transformation is a compact. So I'm conjugating these representations by something in a compact group. And so by subsequencing, I can assume that the conjugated representations converge. That's because I've done a conjugacy by it, something in a compact group. So I can replace the original. I can replace the original domains by, I can now assume that the domains all have cent the same center of mass in this affine patch, and they all have diagonal um, inertia tensor, and the representations are still converging. So now I want to turn this inertia tensor into the identity matrix. And so I can do that by rescaling the coordinate directions. So I can, if I take a, if I take a positive diagonal square root of this inertia tensor and rescale the coordinate dimensions using this this um, matrix, I'm now going to change the domains by applying a diagonal matrix. Then I can get at the standard inertia tensor the, uh, given by the identity matrix, and I get new domains where I'm conjugating now by a diagonal transformation. And now the advantage is, ha so ha having, uh, so of course, now the danger is I've conjugated these converging representations by diagonal matrices that can be going to infinity. So the danger now is that these conjugated representations no longer converge, they go to infinity. But the Fritz John theorem tells me that all these new domains now, they've all got standard inertia tensor. So this, they all contain a small box and they're all contained in a big box. And so that means that, um, well, okay, so, and then I've conjugated the representations and they preserve these new domains. So these new domains now are um, in this nice position. And, well, these domains are Benzikri domains. So contained in a big box, so contain a small box. So I can pass to a subsequence of these domains that converge to a domain of this form. The, the set of such domains is compact. So after subsequencing now, I can assume that these, these domains I've moved are converging to some limiting domain. I still don't know the representations converge, but I've got the domains converging now and uh, to a properly convex domain. And I've got the representations, well, they're conjugated by these enormous diagonal matrices. So now the box estimate comes in. So I've got all these representations row K, and they're converging to some limiting representation. Um, so um, if I take a group element, then if I take apply the if I use the original representation before I did the conjugation by the diagonal matrix, I get some matrix, and I'm putting the, the k here. So for each rep, the k to representation, I get matrix number k here. And then I've done the conjugacy by the big diagonal matrix, and I get some other matrix B here. Now the original representations were converging, so these matrices converge to some limiting matrix. The box estimate tells me that these matrices have the property that the IJ entries are bounded by a fixed multiple of the entry in the bottom right corner. Now then, the entry in the bottom right corner of the B matrix is the same as the entry in the bottom right corner of the A matrix because I conjugated by a diagonal matrix. So these things are converging. Therefore, these things are converging. So that means there's some constant L so that all the entries in all these matrices independent of K um, are bounded by this constant because the bottom right corners are bounded by some constant. So these conjugated matrices now, all the entries in them are bounded. So I can subconverge so they Conjugated matrices converge to some limiting matrix. 
And so there's some subsequence where the conjugated representations converge. And at this point, you're sort of done. I mean, there's some fiddling to do. So we've now, I've argued that there's a sequence of conjugacies and a subsequence. So um, both the domains converge and the representations converge. So we've got some limiting discrete faithful representation acting on some properly convex domain. So we can quotient out and we get a manifold N. So N um, is the quotient of this limiting domain by this limiting group. So it's got the same fundamental group as N, and everything's a K pi 1. Actually, this manifold, the manifold we've just produced, the limiting manifold, is homotopy equivalent to the manifold we started with because they've got the same fundamental group. We want to know they're homeomorphic. So now I'm going to use a little trick. I'm going to, so one later on, if I have time, I'll prove that the set of holonomies of strictly convex structures is an open set. So if you have a strictly convex structure and you change the representation a little bit, you've got a new strictly convex structure. So I want to know that N and M are homeomorphic. And um, if I take one of these representations that's converging to the limiting representation, well, that because this representation is close to this one, the quotient of omega prime, the omega prime by gamma prime is homeomorphic to N. But it's also homeomorphic to M um, because all I did was conjugate. And so using the fact that holonomies of Strictly convex structures are an open set. We see that N and M are actually homeomorphic. Well, I had a hypothesis that at this point, I've proved that the limit is a properly convex manifold. But we actually need to know it's a strictly convex manifold. Happily, whether a properly convex manifold is strictly convex or not, only depends on the fundamental group. The point is that a properly convex manifold is strictly convex if and only if the fundamental group's word hyperbolic. And so if M is strictly convex, that's so fundamental group's word hyperbolic, same fundamental group as N, so N is strictly convex. So that's the proof of in the closed case. By the way, in the closed case, this theorem is due to Goldman and Choi in dimension two and to Inkang Kim in dimension three, and to Yves Benoit in all dimensions. So I've just given a proof in the closed case. The point, though, is that this proof works when you have generalized cusps. The only catch is that you've actually got to show that the ends of this limiting manifold are generalized cusps. So if you understand limits of generalized cusps really well, that you can, this theorem extends to the case when there are generalized cusps. And so, um, okay. Are there any questions on that? So, the other part of the story is so, what I've just proved is the set of holonomies of strictly convex structures is a closed subset of the representation variety. Now one wants to show it's an open subset. In other words, one wants to show if you have a strictly convex structure, yeah. Say so, it again, sorry. Yeah. Uh, if they aren't strictly convex, then the limiting representation might not be discrete faithful. So you get this limiting domain. So you get a limiting domain, um, and you get a limiting group action, but it could be trivial. Or in general, it needn't be, it needn't be um, a discrete faithful representation. So strictly convex tells you this limiting group is isomorphic to the group you first thought of. And therefore, the limiting manifold is homotopy equivalent to the manifold you first thought of. Does that answer the question? So there's a very general principle, never mind projective geometry, for GX structures. So we're 
this is sometimes called the Erasmus Thurston principle. If you have a closed manifold, you can think about GX structures. So you've got some Lie group G acting nicely on this, transitively on this space X. And you can think about a GX structure. In particular, you can think about projective structure. And, um, and when you have a projective, you have a GX structure, you have a holonomy homomorphism. And then the theorem is that the set of holonomies of uh, GX structures on a closed manifold is an open subset in the set of all representations. This is, um, so th this is, is uh, a theorem about closed manifolds. And um, uh, the proof is very simple. So if you triangulate this manifold, you get some lifted triangulation on the universal cover. So I've called that script T. Every element of the fundamental group gives you a covering transformation. So suppose you have some homomorphism of the fundamental group into G, some representation. And suppose for every simplex, you've got a map of that simplex into X, satisfying two properties. The first property is an equivariance property, that if you take an element of the fundamental group, and you've got some simplex, which is the image of another simplex under a covering transformation, then the map for the simplex sigma is related to the map for the simplex sigma prime by, well, compose this map with the covering transformation, that should be the same as compose this map with the holonomy homomorphism. That's the equivariance property. And the second property, compatibility. If you've got a face of a simplex, the map for the face should be the restriction of the map for the simplex. So suppose you've got you've got a homomorphism and you've got all these maps. Then you can put all these two maps together and you get a, a map from all of the universal cover into X. Its restriction to each simplex is what you want it to be. And it's equivariant. That if you compose this, this map with a covering transformation, that's the holonomy composed with F. Now, um, so I, the, this applies, for example, to the trivial representation. I'm not saying anything's a homeomorphism yet. This would apply to the trivial representation. Now then, if you change the homomorphism a little bit, there are only finitely many, well, there's infinitely many, there's finitely many simplices in N. And of course, each simplex may have infinitely many lists to the universal cover, but never mind. If you take a nearby representation, um, you can find for every one of these maps, you can find a nearby map satisfying these two properties. And the reason is you've only got to do it finitely many times. You know, because this is why you use M is closed. There are finitely many orbits of simplex, and you've only got to do it for one simplex in each orbit. And so if you only move the representation a very tiny amount, you can change this map a tiny amount, so you have, still have these properties. And so that gives you a new equivariant map. Now then, we want to apply this in the case of a geometric structure. So for a geometric structure, you're going to start out with a developing map, F. So a developing map is a local homeomorphism. And then um, this new map, will be a local homeomorphism because you only change this a little bit on finitely many simplices. And so the new map will be a developing map of a new holonomy. So that's the proof that holonomies of GX structures is open. So this applies in particular to projective structures, but it doesn't apply to properly convex projective structures. Um, because so uh, <clears throat> there are a couple of issues here. I mean, properly convex projective structures on uh, they're more special than GX structures, and uh, we want to extend it to the non-compact case where we have cusps. And there's a problem. I mean, you can take a hyperbolic surface with a cusp, so it's got some holonomy. And the holonomy of this loop going around the cusp is a parabolic. Now, you can change this homomorphism a very small amount so that the, this loop is now an elliptic. 
And this will be a non-discrete group. It doesn't give you the I mean, we've changed the holonomy a small amount, converting this parabolic to an elliptic, and there cannot be a um, complete hyperbolic metric with this holonomy. In fact, there's a cone manifold, but that's not what we're after. We're after a, a GX structure, a complete hyperbolic structure. So there's a problem in trying to extend this theorem to um, non-compact manifolds. But there's a very general solution involving the notion of relative hol holonomy. So I'm going to have some manifold M, which is not compact. And uh, we, there's, some, um, there's some compact piece A, and then there's some non-compact piece made of various components, B1, B2, BK, and so on. So this manifold M is union of two parts, a compact part A, the rest of the stuff B, B's got various components. Um, and um, so one has something called the relative holonomy set. So what is the set of relative holonomies? Well, we're going to look at, you know, we've got some GX structure on the manifold M. Even though it's non-compact, we've got a GX structure. We're going to take the holonomy of that GX structure together with developing maps for each of the Bs. So we're going to take all elements in the product of the homomorphisms of the fundamental group into G and the developing maps with the property that the holonomy of the developing map in each of these non-compact bits is um, the restriction of rho to that submanifold. Okay, so if I give you a point in this space, I'm giving you um, a homomorphism together with a GX structure in each of the beads. And there's something called the extension theorem that is if you take if you take the developing map for GX structures on this non-compact manifold N, and you map it into this relative holonomy space. So there's a, a topology on here. There's a topology on here, and there's a topology on the set of developing maps coming from the weak topology on smooth maps from here into X. This is a topological space, and uh, the Extension theorem tells you that this map is continuous and open. And it's basically, the proof of this is basically the triangulation proof of the Erisman Thurston theorem. You're given geometric structures in the ends, and there's an issue if you've got to do some isotopy to ensure that the I mean, so we're using the Erisman Thurston principle to say that if we change a holonomy, there's a nearby geometric structure on this compact piece. We're given nearby geometric structures on these non compact pieces, and you've got to argue that you can actually ma make those match on the overlaps to prove this. So, um, so this is general. This is nothing to do with real projective geometry. This is a, a general thing about. Um, GX structures on non-compact manifolds. So we want to apply this in the situation of a strictly convex manifold, a properly convex manifold, where A is going to be compact, and then these N, these bits are generalized cusps. And so um, we've got a geometric structure on a manifold with generalized cusps. We change the holonomy a little bit. Um, we, what we need to know is that when we change the holonomy a little bit, there are nearby geometric structures on the generalized cusps. This theorem will tell us there is a nearby projective structure on the whole thing. The extension theorem, the general theorem, will tell us a nearby projective structure. Um, if we know that there are nearby generalized cusps, coming from the nearby holonomies. 
And then you confront the problem. Okay, we know there's a nearby projective structure on here. We know the end to generalized cusps. Is this projective structure properly convex? And so we need a theorem that says if you have a projective structure on a manifold that satisfies some condition, then it's properly convex. And if we have that theorem, then we're done. So um, given a projective manifold of dimension n, there is an affine manifold of one dimension higher called the tautological line bundle. Um, there's a map from Euclidean, the, from Rn plus 1 minus the origin to projective space. The fibers of that map are lines. This is a line. So Euclidean space minus the origin is a line bundle over a projective space. If we have a projective manifold as a developing map of the universal cover into projective space, you can pull back this line bundle and you get an affine manifold called the tautological line bundle over the original projective manifold, the universal cover. The holonomy acts on the universal cover of M. It also acts on this tautological line bundle. And so the end result is that given a projective manifold M, there's an affine manifold of one dimension larger called the tautological line bundle. And that's not compact. I mean, you've got these lines. You can make, you can compactify it by quotienting out by multiplication by two in the radial direction. You get something called the tautological circle bundle. So that's an affine manifold of one dimension bigger, and it's a circle bundle over the original projective manifold. A special case is if you have a properly convex manifold M, so it's a quotient of some properly convex domain by group gamma. Well, the tautological line bundle over the universal cover of M is just the cone in affine space over omega. And the when you quotient out that cone by the holonomy, you get the tautological line bundle over M. So that's in the special case of a properly convex manifold. This is what the tautological line bundle is. So we're interested in a theorem that says if you have a properly convex manifold, sorry, if you have a projective manifold with some extra structure, then it's properly convex. And this is a theorem of Kozel. So suppose you have a properly convex manifold Suppose you have a projective manifold. It's properly convex if and only if a certain condition happens. And the certain condition is that there is a section of the tautological line bundle, a section, a map from M into the tautological line bundle, with the property that the section is strictly convex away from the origin. And um, so... Uh, so the remaining thing then is to show that, that if you've got a properly convex manifold and the ends are generalized cusps, you change the holonomy a little bit, there's a new properly convex manifold. And you need to know there's this section of this new manifold. Well, on the compact part, there's a strictly convex up section because it's compact. And in the generalized cusps, there's a strictly convex up section because you know everything about generalized cusps. And then you've got to say you can glue those things together in a strictly convex way and you're done. And uh, so that's the end of the proof of open. Um, and um, okay, uh, that's all. Thank you.